Well, welcome to the first of a number of videos to um, look at contemporary learning here at uh, Faith Lutheran College. I'm actually with Derek Bartels at Lutheran Education Queensland in Milton. His role is Director of Innovation and Technology. Um, I might first of all start by asking you, what does your role actually mean? Thanks, uh, Doug. Well, um, the focus at the moment is all, uh, on contemporary learning transformation and contemporary schooling transformation um, across our schools in Lutheran education. And what does contemporary transformation mean? Well, it means actually creating learning and schooling uh, that's fit for today's world, for a contemporary world. Um, and, you know, that might mean uh, experiential pedagogies, uh, teacher teaming, um, getting the culture right, focusing on the big goals of um, enabling students to be successful and richly developing those contemporary soft skills, critical thinking, collaboration, deep sense of empathy, entrepreneurial and entrepreneurial, um, having um, a great uh, way of communicating in multiple modes, uh, working with adults, solving problems, all those rich contemporary soft skills. Okay, so I imagine there's been a bit of research done in this area about where the world is going. Um, mm. How has that contributed to contemporary learning? Sure. There's been a lot of reports coming out from OECD, UNESCO, um, Foundation for, for um, Youth and, and a whole lot of other agencies as well as education agencies around the world um, and the research is showing that the nature of work is different and is changing. And yes, and it is changing probably. The reasons why for it is the nature of technology over the last 30 or 40 years changing the way people work. But it's more human-centred now. So it's calling on those soft skills of being able to be creative and make decisions. So a student coming out of a school or a student coming out of a university, they need to be able to work with others and critically think and not wait to be told what to do. They actually have to create the opportunities themselves and solve the problems themselves. And today that's being called on not years ahead after leaving university when people have to find their feet and develop it. It's been called on students while they're at school, mm -hmm. as early as year one, to be able to start developing these rich contemporary soft skills. So for a lot of our parents, they went to a very traditional form of school, yep. grades, um, you know, high schools, junior schools, those sort of things there. Yep. So they're used to doing maths and science and English. Yep. How would that might, what might that look like yep. in a new way of doing teaching? Yep. Yeah. Well, we just got to look at the world. I mean, we don't operate in disciplines, single disciplines, in the real world. When we have to solve a problem, we call on aspects and processes of all those disciplines and of life and of our life skills to be able to solve the problem. And we can't do it by ourselves a lot of the time too. We have to work with others. In fact, we need to work with others to solve a lot of these problems. So the workplace looks very different. So why can't schooling then start to model this more? And it is happening around the world. Schooling is starting to model this more. So wouldn't it be great if we could solve problems in what's known as a transdisciplinary way. So a student can actually solve authentic real world problems or problems that are modelled in the real world by using their knowledge across and their processes and applications and soft skills across a range of disciplines. I mean, that makes it more meaningful and makes it real. Mm -hmm. That's how we solve problems. When we're solving a problem at home or in real life, at work, we don't say, I'm just now going to think in a mathematics way, or I'm just going to think in a science way, or I'm just going to think in a creative or an English way or social sciences. We need to be able to draw on what we need at the time. And I th that is what the world is calling for. I, th I think there might be a fear amongst parents, though, that if we just let kids do free reign of whatever they do, they're not going to learn anything. They might be worried about what happens in grade 11 and 12. Yeah. And um, what would you say to parents? About well, I that? think that's a, um, a common misconception about transdisciplinary learning or contemporary learning uh, because contemporary learning has a lot of structure. When students have some student agency and freedom, it doesn't mean that they can do anything at any time whenever they want it's actually structured and scaffolded with a lot more um, pillars than has been in the traditional mode. Um, and so that students are guided through activities, they have freedom to choose how they will solve it, but you know, the teacher is really the masterful learner in all this, facilitating that learner, or teachers working as teams, 
um, can facilitate the learning. So it's sometimes easy to think that this is just free range and free reign. It's definitely not. Good contemporary learning is about solving real, real issues and it's about solving problems and having the practice to do that and then developing those soft skills to do it. So it requires quite a bit of structure and quite a bit of work. But at the end of the day, it's so meaningful and so rich, not just for those students to be happy and productive and relevant in their lives, but just for our world. Mm. I know that as a senior maths teacher, one of the things that used to frustrate me is when I'm teaching senior maths, kids would just ask the question, is this on the exam? Yes. And it's their curiosity gets lost. And I remember reading a quote that says, you know, we know we've failed at schools if kids leave school less curious than when they came in. Yes. So this actually helps with that particular yes. issue, doesn't it? Because I think that's an important contemporary skill is being naturally curious mm. and fostering that in, in children. And it's interesting you talk about mathematics, also being a, a, a senior maths teacher. If I was to call on a topic or a unit or a theme such as correlation and linear progression or whatever it may be, I'd be flat out trying to remember how to eat the actual content in that, mm. let alone try to teach it. And the reason being mm. is because I never applied it. Even as a teacher, I never applied how that can be used, mm. or more so how matrices and vectors can be used in real life. Today, today we're attempting to be able to show how the content and the academic rigor can be applied to solve real situations. And let's face it, research has shown that the traditional mode of schooling after examinations or after assessment or after the traditional testing, the content and process are, own, are not retained after three months. Mm. So you've got to ask yourself, why are they learning that in traditional mode or why are we bothering to teach that in traditional mode if after three months, if it hasn't been applied effectively in the teaching and learning, and let's face it, you know, let's look at mathematics. In the old days, traditional mathematics, and even still today, can be taught in a way that doesn't apply to solving real life situations. So after three months, we've lost that. Mm. So what's the point? You've got to ask, what is the point? However, if applied in a transdisciplinary way or even applied in a way that's going to be project-based, so they actually can solve real problems, they can really delve in it, that they can actually have a sustained inquiry mode of being able to actually start to ask those rigorous questions themselves, they are going to retain it. It's going to stick with them. And they're going, it's going to stick with them a lot longer than if they did that in the traditional test mode. Yeah, that's right. I know that we've been visiting a number of schools around the world and yep. in, in Australia, and one of the schools we went to was Temple State College down in, yes. in Melbourne. And one of the former principals, which is Peter Hutton, he on a YouTube video, he, he spoke about... Um, the split within um, kids at school, and he would say that a third of students uh, would find school fine. A third would just go, it's blah, it's a, it's a hoop to jump through, but it's not actually engaging me at all. And for another third, it's actually detrimental to their well-being yep. um, under the normal traditional yes. form of schooling. What would you say about that? Yeah, and that, 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 that is so true. Um, and it's that, um, it's that, you know, that, that initial third that are happy to go through the hoops, that's either the way that their DNA is, you know, is wired, or the way they're wired, or it could have some environmental effect. It still doesn't mean that that first third are going to be successful in mm, life. That's right. All it means is that they're able to jump through the hoops of traditional schooling or mm. test prep and then get through it. But when they get into life, sometimes it's some of that first third that find it the most difficult to deal with life because all of a sudden no one is telling them when to do something and how to do it mm. and you know there is research around the world that shows that university graduates um, who are going into the workforce whether it's engineering or other um, other specialties there's been associations that have said in past years we don't want graduates coming out that just know the content we want them to be able to ask questions. We want them to start communicating, working in teams. We want them to find the problems that they're gonna solve. Not sit there and wait till someone says, this is what you have to do, and this is when you have to do it by. That's, That's right. not what the world is calling for. And so it's great that we have those other two thirds because 
that's prompting us to really think about how we reform education mm. so that all kids can thrive no matter their circumstance. And that's so, so important. And it's even more important in today's world. Yeah, I find that really interesting is that one of the things that I know that I look for in employees is initiative. Yeah. And when students don't get that opportunity to show initiative, how do they develop it? Mm. You know, I find that quite interesting. Um, in terms of uh, student agency and choice and those sort of things, because one of the things that I find interesting is that probably that top third that we yep. say that it works for yep. is actually where teachers come from. Yep. Yep. And so they just want to replicate what worked for them yep. without realising that for two thirds it didn't. Yep. But in terms of student agency and ch student choice, what, what does, how does this play into this whole, yeah. whole process? And I think it ties into what you were about uh, saying before in terms of showing initiative. If we don't allow students in learning and through contemporary modes of learning to be able to have student agency and student choice and voice to be able to make decisions, they're not going to be able to do it any other way. So that's really, really important. And it's really, imp uh, really important for the opportunities, the learning opportunities to be able to do that well. And they, it needs to do it well in a way that allows students to make decisions. And those decisions aren't gonna be right all the time, mm. but allows them to make decisions and if they're wrong decisions to reevaluate and reiterate. Because you can't get into the world and expect employers or expect colleagues to say, you have to make a decision. And then all of a sudden you say, hang on, how do I make decisions? Mm -hmm. I never really was taught how to make decisions. I never really had opportunities to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to do that. And it's wonderful to see progressive contemporary schools from year one, allowing students to have choice, mm -hmm. have voice, show initiative, make decisions in a safe environment that they can, can guide it along the way when they make the wrong decisions, which is valuable in itself. So I think that's that's so, so important. Yeah. And I think you've brought a really good point in terms of a safe environment. I remember, I can't, I think it might have been um, a, that guy from Stanford Uni that spoke about um, uh, like restaurants and chefs and in, in, in a restaurant environment, chefs don't necessarily have the ability to show innovation because the risk of failure is too high because when people go into a restaurant, yeah. they expect something to be perfect and when they're paying yeah. for it. And so as schools, we need to create a safe environment to fail, yeah. but we're also set amongst this whole standardised testing and yeah. ATAR and all this sort of stuff there. So yeah. what, would you talk, what would you say about that? Yeah, and look, this is where, this is, this is the hard part, isn't it? The world is, you know, if we were to look at progression over the last 10, 15, 20 years, the world is more aware of what we are talking about. But unfortunately, there's regimes and there is also um, organisations in place and there's structures and processes in place that we are still holding on to, be it that they've transformed a little bit or, or whatever, and some of that is external testing, mm -hmm. um, external state testing or external state standardisation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you know, as um, Sir Ken Robinson and others have said, as soon as we start to look at kids as data points, data points, then we start to lose the fact that they're organic, growing, developing individuals. And individuals, important, that all develop and learn at different rates, different ability, different aptitudes. And as soon as we start plotting them as data points, we miss that inherent critical point. So yes, we will have those traditional modes of um, assessment and standardised and state testing still around. But I think it's important how we actually position those in our own minds to say that's one form of evidence in one particular mode. Mm, that's okay. right. Yeah. So, you know, we don't usually, we can't be judged on one big test on how well we actually are going to do in life. Mm. And you and I and others all know that, you know, our successes and our failures in life was not about 
that standardised test back at school. That's right. And I think, you know, in wrapping up, the, the challenge that we have in the schools is that we know that there's these 21st century skills that we need to develop, collaboration, creativity, leadership, all those sort of things. And we know that in order for innovation to occur, we need to allow and create a safe place for failure to occur. And I think that's the challenge that we have. And so over the next couple of episodes, we're going to actually unpack what Faith Lutheran College is going to do in these areas here. But thank you so much for this interview. And Thanks, I hope that, I hope that gives the, uh, the families and the wider community a bit of understanding of what we're trying to do. But over the next few episodes, we'll go into the timetable, we'll go into some restructures, and, and, and then the journey that we're going to take over the next few years. So thank you very much. Thanks, Doug. Okay, thanks.